Alrighty, good evening, folks. I have some real good news to share with you. Uh, before we do that, let me bring you up to speed. Some of you were at lunch today when a little lost dog wandered into the lunchroom. And I'm anticipating uh, many more of you will ask me, well, what happened to the dog, you know? And uh, I am pleased to tell you that uh, the dog escaped from a car at the post office when somebody came in to do their business and he just walked into the open doors of the church while, uh, while we were eating lunch and while the children were being picked up. And of course he was taken into loving arms and held and, until one of our security guards saw a man looking around in the bushes of the church and said, can we help you? Well, I've lost my dog, he said. And the security guard said, aha, I have good news for you. Your dog is found. And he has been reunited with his owner. Now, as good a news as that is, I have even better news for you. Some of us have been wandering around a little bit lost ourselves. And the church doors were open tonight, and we came in, didn't we? And God says, welcome to you. I'm glad you're here. You're in the house of God, into God's arms. And God, like a mother, like a father, has brought us into his presence to hear Dr. Boyd, our Perkins lecturer, and uh, for this sixth lecture. How many of you have heard all six of these? I'm, I am just curious. Okay, that's great. I don't see all the hands up, so I simply must take this moment to tell you that we will have videos and CDs available because some of you have missed some of these great lectures. And uh, we have a, a lady, I can see her now, she's in the narthex, she's at a table, she's holding up an order form and she has, uh, 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 she can take your order tonight or you can order by our website or, or by mail later on. Uh, if there are any of Dr. Boyd's books left, she can help you with that. Uh, and they are hard to find. Uh, you better get one if there's any left because otherwise you'll have to go to the used bookstores. They're, they're, they're rare and they're hard to find. Isn't that, isn't that about right, Dr. Boyd? They're, they're, yes. they're, they're scarce as, <laughs> as hen's teeth and we're only asking the list price, so you better get them. Anyway, we welcome you. If you would now, uh, because you are here in God's arms and because that dog has been found, it's time to sing Joyful, Joyful, and that's number 89. Let's sing like we mean it.
Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading for tonight comes from the Gospel according to Matthew. Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 through 19. Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 through 19. Jesus asked, How can I describe this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and shouting at each other. We piped for you and you would not dance. We wept and wailed and you would not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He is possessed. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton, a drinker, a friend of <gasps> tax collectors and sinners. And yet God's wisdom is proved right by its results. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May we pray. Dear gracious and majestic God, we come to you this evening with an attitude of thankfulness. We are thankful for the gift of your scripture to us. We are thankful that the Lord of the universe desires to speak to each of us. And we thank you for the ways that you tune our lives. Forgive us for any discord that we have produced. As your instruments, help us to resonate with your vibrations. We dedicate this evening to you. In your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen.
During these days and nights of the 63rd Perkins Lectureship, we have been taken to places where we needed to go and have been given stories and messages we needed to hear. At one point, as I was reflecting on what we had been told about the harvest and what is necessary for that harvest to happen, I found myself thinking about the fact that in a number of languages, the word for sky and the word for heaven are the same. Struck by the mystery of that, I began to realize something else that these sermons were bringing to mind, the power of the fact that, as Jesus told us, the kingdom of God is among us. And as I thought about that mystery and those other pointers toward mystery called signs and wonders, still another matter struck me, one intimately related to what we've been hearing, and that's this. These sermons, these lectures, have come to us as fruits of a bountiful harvest and an essential stewardship that we have been blessed to experience. With these things in mind and in heart, I'm glad to present one whose voice is on fire with the power of faith, the Reverend Dr. Morris Boyd. Thank you so much. I really need your help tonight. Because I hope that we'll be doing something together. I'm going to have a question for you in a little while. And I'll be thinking it through, but I want to think it through with you as you think it through. It can be great fun. And I hope, I hope enriching for us. But do get into it and let your imagination begin to play, will you? Let, let's, let's do it together. Let me begin, though, by saying how gracious of you and how kind you have been to me. I heard many years ago of a, a little boy, and he was going to his first party. And his mother said to him before, it, before she let him go out the door, and I, you'll be sure to thank this so-and-so for having had you. Well, he went out and had a marvelous time at this party. He'd never, at first party, never been there, but he never imagined it would be anything like this. And when it was time to go, he sort of rubbed the last crumbs from around his mouth and said to his hostess, my mother told me to thank you for having had me. But that didn't seem to be quite enough, didn't quite match the occasion. And he said, my mother told me to Thank you for having had me, and I just have to say that I've been very nicely had. <laughs> now, in all the deepest and richest ways, I have been very nicely had, and it has been a joy to be here to share in the life of your congregation and just to see a minister who loves his congregation and who is deeply loved by them as are all the members of your staff and the sense of wholesomeness and hope and joy that one finds. I've just been delighted to be here, so, so thank you, but now I'd better get on, I'd better get on with this. A number of years ago, I was, I was invited to speak to ministers in one of the Florida conferences. Now, I've forgotten which one it was, but there are a lot of them, there were several hundred of them, and I was to talk to them about preaching and, and, um, and about biblical preaching and so on. So, I said to them at the very start, do you think Jesus was a biblical preacher? 
That's a good question, isn't it? Because as soon as you ask the question, you begin to sort out the ways in which he was and the ways in which he wasn't. Obviously, he was the flower of the Jewish scriptures, no question about that. But was he a biblical preacher? Well, yes, he was. Sometimes he went into synagogue and expounded a text. He didn't necessarily have to choose the text. Sometimes it was given to him, as in his experience in the synagogue in Nazareth, but he expounded a text. At other times, he didn't. His preaching was always biblical in the sense that it was informed by the Hebrew scriptures, but sometimes he saw other things. He saw um, a widow putting some money into the temple treasury. Or he remembered a woman who had lost a coin, or he knew a shepherd, or was told of a shepherd who'd lost it, so, so on and on. But it's a good question, isn't it? And a good question for ministers to ask themselves and to refine it, to refine just that. But then I did something else that was of interest to me. I said to them, uh, had, had, you, had you ever asked that question before? Or had you seen the question written down anywhere? Or had anybody asked the question of you? Was it entirely new? And discover, I'm not making any judgment about it. I mean, I'm not being critical or anything. I'm just observing, uh, passing on a, an observation and, and a fact. And the truth was that nobody had. The question, was Jesus a biblical preacher, was entirely new to them, which was great. I mean, I hadn't thought of it only recently myself, so that, that was fair enough. But So was Jesus a biblical preacher, and that's what happened. Now, not long ago, somebody did something like that to me. And it was possible because I love music. Uh, an amateur musician, that means I just love it. Can't do much with it, but I just love it. And I'm a Christian. And this question just absolutely ca captivated me. As it should anybody who is musical, and a Christian. Now, everybody's musical nowadays, you know that. I mean, you can't buy a sandwich in New York without listening to an orchestra or band or something. A lot of the time, you just wish you'd turn it off, could turn it off. But everybody, we're forced to be. We don't have any choice by everybody's musical. And you wouldn't be here tonight if you weren't Christian. So it's a, it's a question that, that's um, apt for you and me. Now, I have to say some other things before we really get to it. I want you to know that I have a degree in music. And it's an honorary degree, and it's from a very good university. And it's a performing degree. Uh, they didn't give it to me because of any performance that I put on. But they thought I'd been able to encourage some music about the city, and I think they really wanted me to speak at their convocation, so they gave it to me. As I say, it was a performing degree. The person who got it the year after me was da Dame Eva Turner. Now, I don't know if that name means anything to you, but if you love opera and know anything about the history of opera, you'll know that Dame Eva Turner was one of the greatest sopranos that England ever produced. And there is at least one recording of hers available. She had a, well, let, let me sort of give you her, her time and, and place. Uh, she wasn't the first Turandot, but she should have been. The sort of polit political maneuvering got somebody else in. She may well have been the second Turandot of, um, of Puccini's, Puccini's opera. Her voice was so powerful, they had, when they were recording, they had to put her behind the orchestra. And she's just an absolutely splendid person. I met her a couple of times. 
Dame Eva Turner, and she got it the year after I did. Yes. <laughs> this performing degree. So I found myself in pretty elevated company. And I have some other, some other immodest <laughs> claims to uh, distinction in, in music. Do you know John Vickers, J-O-N, John Vickers? Is the name familiar to you? I hope it will be after tonight. Maybe you'll look up some of his recordings. People say that Domingo is the great tenor of our time. And he certainly was a great musician and could sing an enormous number of parts. But there's another tenor whom I consider the greatest Heldon tenor of the 20th century. You know what a Heldon tenor is? Heldon tenor is just a big tenor. I, uh, I might, being here, I might say, a Heldon tenor is a sort of Texas tenor. <laughs> I mean, he's really big, magnificent voice. And I want you to know that I have sung duets with John Vickers. Yep. We were sitting in church together. And we were singing some great hymns. And I must say, I sort of held back. You know, I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't really want to overwhelm him or embarrass him or anything like that. John Vickers, and really, I'm serious about this. Some people say, as I've said to you, that Placido Domingo is the outstanding text. But if you want to hear the greatest Sigmund, or Otello, or Parsifal, or Tristan of the 20th century, then it's quite easy. Just go and get a recording by John Vickers, as I have done. I've heard Placido Domingo in all of these roles. And um, he really is magnificent. And I just want you to know that I've sung with him several duets. And then I want to tell you about how I used to sing with my younger brother, Raymond, who died about two years ago. And Raymond and I were 15, 16, 17 years old, and fell in love with music, and especially with opera. And we were so gifted, I cannot tell you how gifted we were. We not only sang some of the duets, but you know, the two of us, we could sing the quartet from Rigoletto, <laughs> including the orchestral parts. And once or twice, we even had a stab at the sextet from Lucia. Nothing was too difficult. We just, it was just so much part of what we loved. And we did it together and had great fun doing it. So that's something of my interest in music. And then, as I say, I came across a question that had never occurred to me. With all this music in me, you see. I came across this question that had never occurred to me until I read something about Garrison Keillor. And he comes to New York and he made a, 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 a CD, a disc of music. It's about the instruments of the orchestra, not the usual version, but he made that with the orchestra of St. Luke's. And there's a little write up on the back of the disc. And then then here the came the question to me. Here I'm a Christian and a musician, and I had never thought of it. And you're a musician and a Christian. I wonder if you thought of it. Ready? Ready? If Jesus had played an instrument in an orchestra, what instrument do you think he would have chosen? Did you ever think of that? If you thought about that, would you put up your hand and leave? <laughs> and of course, when I say that, I'm really inviting us to say what instrument we think he would have chosen. What do you think? Do you have an opinion already? Do, I don't want to hear it, but do you have one? And if you just hold it for a minute, how would, you, how would you begin to answer the question? How would you be able to say, well, I think this is what he would have played? Well, now let me tell you what I did. May I share this with you? 
I just began to find a way to go think the way, think my way through it and try to find an answer myself, hoping that in so doing I would be nourishing, well, tickling my mind and, and intellect, but also nourishing my Christian faith. So the first thing I did was to think about the instruments, what instruments there are, and what people have said about them, and what they were like, and, and so on and so on. A kind of, kind of review of them. Percussion, woodwinds, brass, strings, and so on. Then I thought of something else. Do you know that in the primitive art of the catacombs, there were many paintings and there were some of Jesus as Orpheus with his lute. Do you remember Orpheus? You remember Orpheus who charmed the trees, the tops of the trees, and everything awakened as he did sing, and the world was renewed by the beauty of his music. Has it helped you already? Would you say lute to Orpheus and his lute who set the whole world dancing to a new and braver music. Orpheus, look, is that it? Mm, that, that occurred to me. But imagine, thou hast conquered, O pale Galilean. The world has grown gray from my breath, was the criticism. Not this Galilean, he was Orpheus, who charmed the socks of them by the beauty of his music. Well, that's, that's one thing, but that, I didn't, that, that's too easy. Had to go through the other instruments began to think about them, and what people had said about them. For example, the trumpet. Would it have been a trumpet? Somebody said of the trumpet that it is noble and brilliant. What do you think? Maybe the violin? Someone said of that that the string, the string is mirth. The chord is melancholy. The violin, the mirth, we piped in. You haven't danced, we've mourned. Would, you haven't lamented, would it be the violin? The bassoon? Somebody called the bassoon the clown of the orchestra. And then there's the organ. A number of people call the organ the king of instruments. I know three people who call the organ the king of instruments. One was Mozart, and there are two Watanabes. What about the piano? Do you know what G.B.S. said about the piano? He said, it is the perfect instrument. The invention of the piano is to music what printing was to poetry. What do you think? Percussion. What about percussion? Somebody said that percussion was a central heating system. <laughs> bagpipe. You know the old story in Ireland is that the bagpipe was a gift of the Irish to the Scots as a joke that they never got. <laughs> and this comment is that 12 Highlanders and a bagpipe makes a rebellion. Or the oboe, plaintive and melancholy, except that Bert Lucarelli, who plays it exquisitely and has recorded much lovely music on it, and who's our good friend, tells us that you really shouldn't attempt to play the oboe until you're 40. <laughs> you know, when you learn it, but until you're 40. It just takes all that time. To, to, is, it, is it so deep, so deep, would that be it? Somebody spoke of the ghostly clarinet. Mm, the ghostly clarinet. Horns and woodwinds, said Richard Strauss, and never let them out of your sight. Someone else said an accordion. <laughs> an accordion is an instrument with the instincts of an assassin. <laughs> what do you think? 
all these instruments. I know a conductor, and he wasn't getting the sound from the orchestra that he wanted. He tried this, he tried that, and then he tried something else. And finally he said, look, you are God's trombones. And he got the sound he wanted. And there was a famous black preacher and poet who wrote a book about that, and he called it God's Trombones. All the, all the instruments of the orchestra. So that's what I did, first of all, all the instruments. Any ideas now? Pick anything? If Jesus were to choose an instrument, instrument, do you think he would choose? So the first thing I did, I thought about all the instruments. And then I said to myself, but, but that, that, that isn't enough. I want to think not only about all the instruments, I want to think about all the instrumentalists, all the people, all the individuals who are there. And as soon as I think of an orchestra, think of the individuals, it becomes enormously moving. It is really high drama. And I never go to a concert or, or to the opera without looking at and seeing it, and there are... They are so varied, all shapes, sizes, and colors. They're in the, in the magnificent Metropolitan Orchestra. And I look at them, and you know what I imagine? I, I try to think of, oh, I try to think of their history, each one of them. And look where they've got. Isn't that exciting? Isn't it? And I don't know anybody, or I think I don't know anybody there, I'm not sure. But, but then I think of some people whom I do know, maybe not personally, but whom I know quite well. And I begin to think of the drama. I, I think of the people about whom I can know enough to get the sense of drama in their lives. And one of the people, people I think about is, is James Galway, Jimmy Galway, the man with the golden flute. You know him? Because he was brought up in the part of Belfast where I had a church. And that's where he learned to play the flute. And the flute is an exquisite instrument. And you know how splendid, how magnificently he, how incomparably, really, Jimmy Galway plays the flute. And he learned to play it in Duncairn Gardens Band, and Duncairn Gardens was the, the place where my church was, and the whole place is full of flute bands, and there was Jimmy Galway with all his buddies, and he lived in East Belfast there, close to East Belfast, in a little kitchen house. And I read a brief autobiographical sketch of, by him, and discovered all thing, kinds of things in common with me and with my father. You know, there's a man who lived in that part of Belfast, and his, his name is Buck Alec, and he had a tame lion. Would you believe it? I'm not making this up. He had a tame lion, and he'd take this tame lion walking, and Jimmy Galway talks about that, and he talks about the preachers in Smithfield Market and the, the customs house steps, and I've been there, and I've done that. And then I think of this wee fella in that working-class district of Belfast, going to play his flute in his flute band, and then realizing, it, it being realized that he was good, and then they found a teacher for him, and so on and so on. What did the neighbors think of him? Nothing like that had ever happened. Jimmy Galway, going to London to play the flute. And then he went and joined the Berlin Philharmonic, as he called it, Herbie's Band. Herbie's band, Jimmy Galway, and then he decided, well, he'd been there long enough, and he became a soloist. And I see all the drama. And when he'd go home to Belfast for his holiday, what it was like, and all the neighbors would come around to have a cup of strong tea. Can you imagine it? And the study and all the rest of it, the high drama that this little boy became this great artist. Kind of overwhelming, doesn't it? And then I thought of Fergus McWilliams. Now, the name doesn't mean anything to you. You probably know him if you've seen the orchestra at all. Fergus McWilliams from London, Ontario, played, played the French horn, that impossible, that impossible instrument. But so gifted. He went to all the musical festivals that my children and grandchildren go, went to and go to, you see. And then, again, gifted and taking more lessons until at last... Fergus McWilliams in the Berlin Philharmonic. Can you believe it? You see, the drama of it. So exciting. The individual. And there, or I think, so fondly now with my younger brother, Raymond, who sang beautifully. 
On a couple of occasions, he sang for us and thrilled us in the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City. I was becoming a preacher, and we'd sing these silly duets and so on together, but he really did have a voice. And I thought he was beginning to take it a little too lightly. And I said to him one day, look, I'm working my heart out at this preaching stuff. Do you think that maybe your voice is a trust, a responsibility? Do you think maybe you're carrying it a little bit too lightly? Giuseppe de Stefano died. Did you know that? The great Italian tenor. Do you know what Placido Domingo said? just died today? Do you know what Placido Domingo said of him? He said he should have been the greatest tenor in the world. He should have been. He could have been, except that he would not discipline himself. Placido Domingo did. And I said to Raymond, do you think you're maybe taking a little... Off he went, found the best voice teacher in the city of Belfast, and he sang until the day he died, and sang well. Do you see the whole drama of it? And you go into, the, you go into a concert or whatever it is, and you see, what's, you see these, and you don't know who they are, but if you begin to think about it and know who they are, then you know that every individual has a story, don't you? And that's not far from this congregation. I mean, I'm talking about what you all know. Did you hear Austin Howard the other day play the organ? He's 15 years old. He played it like Albert Schweitzer. And what a story that is. And you will be proud of it. You are already. And you're engaged in his life. And his father is here and you talk about him. It's just human and wonderful. And the giving of these gifts, oh, the richness of these individual gifts and opportunities when they are fulfilled in that way. Oh, when we begin to talk about the drama of these personal things, I could break your heart with that. With just a couple of lines, Ravindranath Tagore, great friend of Yeats, Ravindranath Tagore. The song I came to sing remains unsung. I have spent my days stringing and unstringing my instrument. Is there any more appalling judgment or greater tragedy than that? Well, that was the, that was the next thing I did. Are you still thinking about the, the uh, thought of the, the instruments? And then I thought about the individual members. And then, you know what I did? I began to think about the orchestra itself as an instrument, made up of all these individuals. But not just individual players. Somehow they all come together and when they're playing well, it is so perfect. The, the orchestra itself becomes the instrument. And it, it excites all kinds of questions. Orchestras are there by necessity. It's wonderful if Jimmy Galway wants to be a soloist and to play his solo bit, but if he wants to play a Mozart, Flute concerto, he'd better have an orchestra, right? Fine for Fergus McWilliams to blow on his, on his French horn, but if he wants to, to play the Mozart horn concertos, then he'd better have an orchestra to accompany him. Necessity. And it's a good question. Well, does the, does the instrument, does he find himself or does he lose himself in the orchestra? What would you say? I suppose you'd want to say that he does something of both, wouldn't you? An orchestra is like human personality. Human personality is not an individual achievement. It is a, a social accomplishment. Nobody was ever a person by himself. Jesus would not have been who he was without the disciples, without Mary and Joseph and all the others. And an orchestra is like that. It shapes, it shapes and creates a thing of itself, a thing of beauty. 
and of greatness. Began to think about and began to think about equality. The equality, equality, we're all for equality. Equality is a mathematical term. Two equals two or something of the sort, some kind of mathematics. And we take mathematics and we apply it to the human condition and to the men and women who make our culture and we talk about equality and it becomes some kind of mathematical thing. Everybody's equal and they are equal down and the whole thing begins to diminish the quality of our civilization. That's what it does. Can't talk like that in equality when you talk about a family. Not mathematically. Can't talk mathematically about families. It just doesn't work. When I was in Toronto, there was a woman whose little boy, tiny, she had fortune. This tiny little boy became very ill and it didn't, didn't, didn't do well and then began to go from bad to worse. And then finally she knew he was going to die and finally he died. And I went to see her. And she said, Mr. Boyd, the, minute, the, the physician who gave me the bad news didn't do very well. He asked me how many children I had, and when I told him I had four, he seemed to think I could afford to lose one. Well, the man's absolutely right mathematically, but that kind of mathematics and that kind of equality doesn't apply to a family. One from four does not leave three. One from four leaves a sorrow as deep as life and a tragedy as long as love endures. Equality in an orchestra. Hmm? All the individual people there. It makes me think about that. What's, what's equal there? The kind of equality that they find it's not mathematical, it's, it's theirs because they're all needed. The bassoon can't say to the flute, I have no need of you. The violins cannot say to the woodwinds, because you have no strings, we have no need of you. We exist by needing each other. And it is only when we are together that the great music can be played. They're not units in an orchestra, they're members of an orchestra, and if somebody is missing, the orchestra is dismembered, dismembered, dismembered. Rather like the church, when the members are not there, the body of Christ is dismembered, and we need each other not because we're equal, but because we're different and because we need each other to make the whole thing sing and to play our music. Do you know Gerald Moore? Gerald Moore was the greatest, the greatest of accompanists. He played for all the, all the greatest singers, without exception, Schwarzkopf, all of them. And he wrote a little book full of wit and humor, and uh, he tells the story I think he must have made it up about the man who played the double bass in the orchestra, oh, grinding away all the time. You know, uh, 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 uh. That's as close as I'm coming to singing tonight. But, that's what he was, but they, well, they, they gave him a night off, says Gerald Moore, and he decided he'd go on to see what was going on in this. So we went. The next day he came back to the orchestra full of pith and vinegar and said, My goodness, it's wonderful. Have you any idea what goes on here? He said, you know, when we are down here going, uh, 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 there's somebody go up there going, da, 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 da. They need each other. We grind away and the others sing, and so it is that the music is made. We think of the orchestra itself. Or I think of something else. I think of the the relation between the aesthetic and the moral in an orchestra. The aesthetic, they want to make it beautiful. And do you know what they, the only way they can make it beautiful is to discipline themselves, to hold back. 
the earlier question, does the soloist find himself or lose himself? There's a sense in which his individuality is lost in the character and beauty of the whole thing, restraint, discipline. It is in that discipline and restraint that he finds his freedom. And in our culture, we say that freedom is the absence of restraint and the lack of discipline. Discipline is the very condition of freedom. Malcolm Mungridge used to put it very clearly. He said, look, if you, want to, if you want to enjoy the freedom of the seas, you'd better submit yourself to the discipline of chart and compass. And we see it in this aesthetically gorgeous thing that must restrain itself in consideration of others and be brought. And not only that, but this group of superb people who are under the discipline, who are under the authority of the music, of the score. They can't just do anything. They are under authority. And because they are under authority, they have it. And they're able to... You see the lessons that start to come out of it? As soon as you begin to think of our question about Jesus and the instrument that he might choose and where we might place him. Hmm? Well, then my thought moved on. What have we thought about the, the instruments and the individual players and all the high drama of that? And, and then this glorious, unimaginable thing that is, uh, it, it is always a, a, a hazardous thing to put words into the mouth of our Lord, but I do this in, in, in all conviction and with reticence. If Jesus Christ had known an orchestra, I am quite sure on one occasion he would have said, therefore the kingdom of God is like an orchestra, and emphasizing some of the things that we have said. Well, that brings me to the next thing. Then I began to say to myself, well, if he were there, uh, would he be, um, would he be the conductor? What do you think? Maybe his instrument would be the whole orchestra, and he would be uh, the conductor. Sir Thomas Beecham said, once there are two golden rules about an orchestra, they should start together and end together. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, these heavy thoughts that I bring to you. Yeah. And it is, the conduct, it is the conductor's responsibility to see that that happens. They should begin together and they should end together. Well, it can get better than that. Sir Simon Rattle, just before he went off to Germany, I heard him say, that the, that the conductor's task oh, is to make the orchestra play the music he hears. Ah, mm. now that's suggestive. To make the orchestra play the music he hears. And how splendidly some of them do that. There was an orchestra playing once in Germany and they were playing fairly well under their conductor. It wasn't at a concert, it was some kind of a rehearsal. And, the, and this is true, I'm not making any of this up. These are not sort of oft-told anecdotes. These are um, definite instances. And suddenly some of the people in the hall noticed a new quality come into the orchestra and into the playing. And they didn't know why until they turned around and they saw that Wilhelm Furtwangler had just come into the hall. And he wasn't conducting anything. He made no gesture. He was just there. And so was the power of this profoundly dedicated musician, that simply by his being there, the orchestra began to play better. Some years ago, years before he died, Toscanini went across to England, and he conducted one of the English orchestras and I listened to the concertmaster talk about it. He said, you know, Toscany enabled us to play music we didn't think we could play. Now, 
doesn't, doesn't that suggest to you that if our Lord were to choose an instrument, it would be the whole orchestra, and that he would be the conductor of the orchestra, and he would teach them to play his music? And there's another way in which it seems to me an appropriate thing to say that Jesus is the conductor, because the conductor is under the authority of the score. He doesn't play his own stuff. He plays the music that is truly the expression of what the composer wrote. And Toscanini was fierce about that, fierce about that. To be true to what was there and to play what was written and to do it with faithfulness, so that the composer's intention could be heard. I think it's easy to think about Jesus as the, as the conductor, because I think it's easy to think of the psalmist like that, because that's what we've got. It wasn't an orchestra, really. But you remember how he was calling on on everything to praise God, and it, it really is just like a, a symphony. And, and he says, mountaintops, you come in now, and great deeps, you come now, great dragons, you now sing, and let, let the trees of the field clap there, you come in now, until all of nature was together singing the praise of God. Do you think maybe that Jesus would have done something like that? I think it, it suits in that way, because he knew himself to be under authority. He didn't, he didn't do anything but play the melody that he heard and did it as God's intention for his children. Hmm? Well, what do you think? Is it an instrument? Is it the whole orchestra? Do you think that he's the the conductor. There's a lot to be said for that one, is there? What do you think? But you can go even further, as I did, and, and say, well, is he the, is he the composer? Does he make, make the music? And, uh, oh, it's so interesting to think of that, isn't it? That he was the composer what composer do you think it would be like? Wagner or, or uh, Verdi or Gounod or Delius? Or... I think if I had to choose one, I'd probably choose Elgar. Because Elgar wrote the Enigma Variations. And do you know what he did in the Enigma Variations? He set all his friends to music, every one of them with these gorgeous themes. Some of, you, some of you know them, some of you were married, married to the music of Elgar. He took each person and he set the person to music. Think of Jesus doing that like a, a kind of Elgar. If that's the sort of composer he would be, what kind of music do you think he would write for you? Can you imagine that? And it would be music that would express your beauty and also the depth of your mystery. Oh, what sensitivity he would bring were he the composer. All that depth and all that sensitivity right there. The enigma variations that held something of the person and also held back something from the person, which we all do when we are true, when we are true to ourselves. But then I say, no, not the composer. He wouldn't have that. He wouldn't have that because he knew that there was a melody greater than anything that he would make that was happening in, in the world and in his life. You see, when Elgar wrote the Enigma Variation, he set each of his friends to music. But then he said, but the real enigma is a melody, listen, that is played 
but not her that holds the whole thing together. And that's what Jesus was after all the time. How he called the music out of Mary Magdalene. How he found the strength in Andrew and Peter and all the others. How he enhanced all the beauty of all their lives with melodies heard and unheard. But always there was another melody played but not heard which was the mark of his life, and he tuned his ear to it, and all the little enigmas were wrapped around by the great enigma and the higher music and the loftier melody. I told you the other night that I made a sermon, began to make a sermon about Joseph the Beautiful Dreamer, and it was a good sermon, and I came to it just before the end of the week and, and liked what was there. And then, you know, Joseph and his dreams, all these dreams. And then I said, no, 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 that's not it. If you say that, then whatever else, you, you've missed it. It's not Joseph who is the great dreamer. It is God who is the great dreamer. And Joseph's dreams are dreams within a dream. There is another composer playing the music. There is another dreamer dreaming of his world of goodness and beauty, of joy. We are all dreams within a dream. And our task is to catch that music just, just a little bit and, and begin, begin to express it. I said to you, we talk about about bringing home the harvest, and then we find that Paul simply tells us, no, it's not that, it's not you, it is that you are God's garden, and God is the gardener, and He it is who does all the enriching of the soil and all the cultivation, because He wants a crop. The work is not ours, it is God's. Beyond anything that we do, it is His. I told you about the kingdom of God, the being like a dealer in pearl. The kingdom of God is like a dealer of pearls who finds the pearl of surpassing worth and lets everything else go, makes everything else subject to the primacy of this pearl of great price, and you're it. That's why he made the whole world and the whole song of creation. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, it was just to celebrate that the pearl of great price was being made. And the whole universe was made for you. And it is your home. And you're what it's about and what it leads to and what justifies and what makes sense of it. You and I to that higher music that goes on and on and on. And I think Jesus was a bit like that. He wasn't, he wasn't the composer. He was always pointing beyond himself to the composer. Sometimes that happens. Many, many years ago in an NBC symphony orchestra rehearsal, Toscanini was leading the orchestra, and they, they got carried away. They, they achieved what somebody calls a frisson. It is that they all start, started to play, play beyond themselves. Do you ever do that in your own work? I had, a, I had a letter some time ago from a young woman whom I brought into the Christian ministry, and she said, Dr. Boy, I just wanted you to know that this morning I preached better than I can preach. It's like Hemingway. Most of the time I write as well as I can. Occasionally I write better. Do you ever get that? When you're somehow taken out of yourself and, and beyond yourself? Well, here was Toscanini conducting the NBC, and they were rehearsing Beethoven, and they, got, they didn't stop. There were no stops, there were no pauses, there was no advice. They just went on and on and on. And when it was over, the people who were there were ecstatic, and the orchestra was too, and they began to applaud, and strange, they began to cry, Toscanini, Toscanini, Toscanini.
And Toscanini stood up and he said, Toscanini, to who is Toscanini? Toscanini is nothing. Beethoven is everything. And our Lord is not the composer because he was constantly pointing beyond himself. All the time he was saying, don't look at, don't look, look at the Father. My words are what the Father gives me. My, my deeds are what the Father tells me to do. Philip, don't you know that, that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Don't we understand that the greatest claim he ever made was that he was totally derived? He claimed nothing for himself and gave everything away to the Father. Well, where are we? Hmm? We've talked about the instruments, and we've talked about the, indiv the drama of the, of the individuals, we've, we've talked about the conductor, we've talked about the composer, and what do you think? Well, if Jesus were to choose an instrument, what do you think? What do you think it would be? Well, let me tell you my verdict. You ready? Have you got your own yet? I think he's the music. Dr. Fosdick said once, the life of Jesus was lived like music to be played over and over again. He's the music. And to know that he is and to play that music over and over again is the very, is the very purpose of our life and the very meaning of what it is to be a Christian. When my daughter Jennifer was a little thing about this size, you know, she, she moved so quickly, I don't think she ever touched the ground. She never seemed to walk. She was always in some higher state of animation. And I remember once again when I was in Sarnia, sitting in the living room, working away, and Jenny needed something. She wanted to ask me something, and she came in, and she... I was listening to some music and, and working at my notes and so on. And she came in and asked me, and I told her, and then she began to walk. Walking this time, I didn't understand that. And the music was playing, and I said, Jenny, there's music playing. Why aren't you dancing? And at that, she picked her step up, and again left the room without once touching the carpet. There's music playing. Why aren't you dancing? Oh, Orpheus with his lute who brought his music into the world. How great to catch the melody, to know the tune, to tune our instrument and to find it. And how sad when it doesn't happen. And if you think that all of this misses a point of scripture, then let me bring you right back to our scripture reading. Because he said, with all the sadness of the world. How are we to describe this generation? They are like children sitting in the streets and calling to one another. We have piped for you and you have not danced. It is as though he came to us, every one of us, and said, Do you want, there is music playing. Why aren't you dancing? Do you not hear it? 
And when we think of judgment, is not the sad. We think of the wrath of judgment and the tragedy of judgment. Of course we do, and so we ought to. But do you ever think of the sadness? There's just the sheer sadness of judgment in this sense, where in fact we have the very voice of God weeping and saying, what's wrong with you? Do you not hear the music that has been playing from the very foundation of the world? And when he came himself to tell us of all the charm and beauty of it, we turned away and we wouldn't dance. Oh, Iago, the pity of it, Iago, Iago, the pity of it. Do you ever think of the pity of judgment? It's not that we make him angry. It is that we break his heart. It is that we come so far short of what he wants. And he wants his children to know his music and to learn his dance. And we won't listen. And that's the sadness of it. Now I'm just about finished. But oh, a couple of weeks ago, some friends invited me to the Met to De Valkyrie, and James Morris was singing Wotan. And I've seen, heard him sing. I've seen and heard him do that so many times. I think he's one of the greatest Wotans ever uh, to have sung. I've listened to most of them, most of them on record, but I've heard him several times. And you know that enormous, that enormously sad scene at the end of De Valkyrie, where Brunhilde, by her disobedience, has forfeited her divinity, and the gods must punish her. Wotan, her father, the god, very foolish god, and all that, but nevertheless. And he will do this by taking away her divinity, and she will be possessed by the first man who finds her. And at the end of the Valkyrie, he, Wotan, and his daughter, Brunilda, sing. He to her, and she to him. And all oh, the sadness of it is unbearable. How great this loss, how much tenderness in his judgment, how moving. But her music has not been sung, and it's impossible to look at it and to listen to it. Without knowing a heartbreak, We said today that Jesus didn't say much about the word because back to biblical preaching was Jesus a biblical preacher. He didn't say much about the word because he was himself the word. He did not say much about grace because he was himself the grace. And if we had to find for him his instrument, Surely, it would be the music itself. Because that's a music that we can catch, and a tune we can hold, and a beauty we can sustain by his grace. So that the song he came to sing and sang so splendidly is heard again and again and again. I said to you today, and really it becomes more and more true of my experience, that the real break in Christian discipleship comes not when we look at Christ, but when he dwells within us. Not when we see him, although that is so important, but have so seen him that we begin to see everything through him. Be thou my vision doesn't mean simply, I hope that we see our Christ, though it means that. 
Be now my vision means that he becomes our way of seeing, that his music is our music, that his goodness is our goodness, that his work becomes our work. Dick Westenberg, my old organ, uh, director of music, died last week, a splendid musician. And once Dick Westenberg gave me a piece of literature in which Lenny Bernstein visited Nadia Boulanger, the superb French teacher of music, when she was dying and he went and was told that he couldn't see her, she had practically gone. And, but he went in anyway and Nadia responded to him and uh, the con not conversation, but, but the, the, the meeting went on for some time until at last she died. And it is full of tenderness, but at the end he said to her, she was then in a coma. Can you hear any music? Yes, she nodded. What composer, what music? Bernstein was thinking Liszt or... No. And then she simply said, one music, one music. And with those words, she died. What if there is one music for us here in time as there will be in the eternal, for us to sing and dance and pray? In this way, we bring him to those who have him not. To me, it was not the truth you taught, to you so clear, to me so dim. It was that when you came you brought a sense of him. And from your eyes he beckons me, and from your heart his love is shed. Till I lose sight of you, and see the Christ instead. Or might we say that we have heard his music and caught his melody and are dancing because there is music playing. Amen. You may remain seated as you take the hymn book and turn with me to page 68, When in our music God is glorified.
now God grant you journeying mercies, friend, the deep peace of the quiet earth to you, the deep peace of the silent stars to you, the deep peace of the flowing air to you, the deep peace of the running wave to you, the deep peace of the Son of Peace to you, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen.